Welcome to NucleCast, the official podcast of the NY Deterrence Center. Each week, we bring you leading experts for a lively discussion on topics related to strategic nuclear deterrence. Our host is Dr. Adam Lauper, Director of Strategic Programs at the National Strategic Research Institute. The views of the hosts and the guests are their own. Welcome back to another great episode of NucleCast. Of course, I'm your host, Adam Lowther, and today we have with us James McHugh. He is a fellow of the National Institute for Deterrence Studies, and you and I and James Davis wrote an article in Ether, which is the Air Force's strategic level professional journal. If For those of you listeners who have never gone out and read Ether. It it was formerly Strategic Studies Quarterly. It's been rebranded to Ether, and it's a great journal and that really talks a lot about sort of the Air Force at the high operational and strategic level and some of the big picture issues about nuclear, China, some of these major sort of strategic issues affecting the service. And you and I did this article. So welcome to the show, by the way. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. So we thought we would talk about the article we, we did recently because we we touched on a subject that is one that has not gotten all that much play. I mean, you wrote another article for SSQ a few years ago that was on conventional nuclear integration. And so this one deals with you and I try to sort of figure out what is this balance and this role of sort of the the U.S. precision guided munitions, our advanced cap- conventional capabilities versus what we might call, you know, non-strategic tactical nuclear weapons? And, you know, what is that balance and what's the give and take? And that was sort of the focus of our argument. So could you lay out for the listeners kind of the the main argument and the main points that were in that article? Sure. Great. Thanks for the opportunity. So uh, really, this has been a, a couple of years in the making. And, and like you mentioned, I had an earlier uh, paper that was, I would say, more theoretical um, and framework oriented. Uh, and just continuing down the, the conversation, uh, if you will, uh, to help it be more reachable and, and more practical, because uh, Jamie and I, uh, for a couple of years, I've been working with war games in, in various roles, and we were finding a consistent challenge uh, from, you can say, both tribes. The conventional tribe having a hard time understanding, uh, especially at the low end, uh, what can and what cannot be done in the nuclear world, and then, then vice versa. And that makes it really challenging to deal with, um, to me, the, the aftermath, right? There is a lot of talk about will they or won't they right now with, with Russia and other entities. Um, but there's not a lot of comfort in talking about that next step, uh, you know, the, the thinking about the unthinkable aspect. But, but the unthinkable now is, is, is it's not the high end. In fact, I find many people are comfortable at the, the, the full exchange scale. But it's this uncertainty of, of what is limited. Uh, and a lot of times people have very different views of that. Um, so I would say that the the core thing that we're trying to do with that paper is, is enable folks uh, to have that conversation, uh, regardless of their, their, uh, expertise background, uh, so that they can have, um, you know, truly a, all the way through to creating that defective, effective deterrence posture. Yeah. And, and in doing this, one of the things that we did was we, we, you know, we sort of opened up with a comparison of what we would call, you know, tactical nuclear weapons by definition tend to be short range weapons. They're not necessarily defined by their yield, but because they're short range, they do tend to be much lower yield. So where a strategic nuclear weapon might range from, let's say, 150 kilotons to 400 kilotons in modern weapons, tactical nuclear weapons could be sub kiloton to, you know, say five or maybe up to 10 kilotons. And, and we said, you know, hey, look, you know, a modern GBU-43 
which is the largest, you know, fielded weapon. The, and it has to be, it's palletized and has to be delivered by cargo aircraft. That's an 11 ton weapon, 11 tons. Whereas we're talking a kiloton, which is a thousand tons. And that, that's a low yield weapon at a thousand tons. So a hundred times bigger than the largest conventional munition. And so we're trying to sort of think through what would be the instances that you could, that you would need something like that. And then where have conventional PGMs, precision guided munitions, where have they come? And where, what are those instances in which you can use that PGM? So for example, you know, part of what, what you contributed in this article was this analysis of a nuclear strike on an airfield versus a conventional strike on an airfield. So can you sort of describe the, the you know, the, the trade-offs for conventional and nuclear strikes on an airfield? Uh, absolutely. And, and those are really important because uh, that's one of the outcomes I think that uh, we were hoping that people would get from reading the article is that there are pluses and minuses, whichever uh, direction uh, you go when you're considering that response. Um, but real quick, before I answer that, I do want to, to kind of just sneak in there. When we're talking low yield, uh, it's difficult um, because of classification issues. But one of the things that I lean on is, uh, I think it was 1995, maybe 96, there was a, an amendment to the NDAA, you can Google it, Sprat first. Um, and those, uh, they, they had inserted uh, an, a caveat where they was uh, denying the ability to design weapons. And they're, through that process and public statements, Congress has essentially said that five kilotons and less is that, that scale. And we chose five in our paper because that's the high end. Because the logic thought is, um, if anything at all, um, if you go to the high end, then anything less would be more limited. Um, so it should be uh, falling within folks' uh, perception of, of acceptable. And uh, like you said, you could go sub-kiloton, uh, and then you would just take those circles on our, our diagram and, and decrease them. But from the, the military effect, direct, immediate military effect, and assumption, fallout free, uh, because that is in line with the concept of being limited, uh, then what you can so expect could you is, describe describe for listeners who may not know what fallout free because when we say you know fallout free um, nuclear detonations people are like what so yeah. explain for folks what what is that exactly it is a very key um, detail uh, that I see mistaken in many conversations um, some might say intentionally conflated in different conversations. But the, the, the key concept, the physics associated with that is, uh, and we can see this from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the, the explosion, uh, the blast wave is so great from the weapon that you don't want to actually detonate it on the ground to achieve maximum area of effect for that moderate or even low level of damage. If you're not trying to destroy an incredibly hardened target, if, again, a large area like a city or something that's going to be slightly hardened, but still spread out over a large area and airfield. And that's what we used in our diagram. Uh, you can see that you can hit quite a number of targets that are far away from being directly underneath that weapon by raising it up higher because of the, the geometry of, of how the, the blast wave will uh, interact with the ground. But fallout free means that additionally, you're keeping it high enough that the fireball never touches and interacts directly with the, the, the ground. And so it is going to have exceedingly uh, less uh, residual long-term uh, radiation effects uh, for the area. Um, and then when we look at the movies, when we look at a lot of analysis, uh, the focus uh, when we talk about fallout is um, hours, uh, days, weeks after the event. And when the weapon is employed as a fallout-free, high height of burst or high enough height of burst so that it does not interact with the ground, then you avoid much of that. Yeah. So the main thing would be that it's, it detonates, you get this big circle and you get a lot of blast and thermal, but that, I, but all of the radiological material, almost all of it is consumed in the fireball. And because it doesn't suck up debris from the ground, which then gets irradiated and then deposited or put into the atmosphere, 
you essentially don't have any fallout. And so therefore, many of the horror stories, you know, of, of irradiated wastelands, you know, that doesn't happen. And, I, you know, it's one of the things you mentioned that I think is important for people to understand is you, you actually, by not putting a weapon on the ground, can do a lot more destruction by having a height of burst that propagates that blast wave you know, further out. And so that's how you collapse buildings, things of that nature. And so you maximize blast. And so that's one of the things that, you know, we we think would probably happen. And if you think about destruction on an airfield, you know, you could probably destroy more airplanes, more shelters, more buildings by detonating above it as opposed to laying a weapon on the ground, then detonating it. And so, and so that's going to, yeah, it's going to have two uh, shortcomings, major and important ones, because uh, it is an assumption that the choice would be fallout free. Um, but the logic that I'm continuing, that we're continuing through the paper is the assumption is that the intent of the, the strike is to stay limited. Uh, so uh, it would certainly be more escalatory to create a large amount of fallout that's going to affect many civilians in comparison to that same strike at a fallout free height of burst. But what the nuclear weapon then uh, gives up, that strike is no longer going to be expected to have lasting effects um, because it neither uh, creates, you know, kind of like a chemical uh, environment where you have an, an area with radiation that you can't go into. And it also more or less is going to leave the runway intact um, because of the nature of the runway and, and no longer being, uh, you know, maybe some burns, but fundamentally you're not talking about a crater you know, many meters across that you think about in terms of, uh, again, movies. Um, alternatively, I mean, this is one of the big things we, we bring up in the paper is to recognize that from a conventional perspective, um, we have weapons, um, we can have a number of weapons on that same platform. We use the B2 because it's the easiest possible comparison. Uh, so you'd have the option for 80 uh, 500 pound bombs. Uh, you could effectively service military term uh, all the different targets uh, across the airfield uh, to the same degree or example being that runway or to a much greater degree because of the ability to actually uh, put craters in many different places on the runway and, and keep that airfield out of uh, commission for a longer period of time. So that just becomes part of your trade-off of what military effect you're trying to achieve. And that's a use case where perhaps in the right conditions, uh, the conventional would be actually more effective uh, for the military effect. Yeah. I mean, that's a, it's a, you know, this is sort of the hard thing because conventional and nuclear, and this is one of the things we sort of try to wrestle with is the idea that there, there can be times when a conventional weapon can, like you say, service a target, destroy the target in a way that you achieve the effect you desire. But uh, the the big challenge can be, what are the psychological effects? How does an adversary perceive it? Is it escalatory or not escalatory? Can you sort of talk about that for a minute? Yes. And, and, and that uh, was what we found interesting was because uh, Jamie and I started down this road of just wanting to help people with that technical consideration. And we quickly came to realize uh uh, he's a foreign area guy. Uh, I'm more of a, a technical guy. And, and, and he put in the paper, uh, you know, this idea that uh, perhaps the, the primary or even the, the sole purpose of that strike would not be the direct military effects, but rather uh, the political and psychological effects. And it's actually going to amplify that message because alternatives exist. So that's a big comparison and change with those psychological and political factors, because those options didn't exist 50 years ago. We didn't have PGMs of this sort, uh, of this capacity, of this uh, certainty, um, you know, 50 years ago when we were worried about defending the Fulda Gap. So when you could choose uh, conventional, but you choose nuclear, and perhaps if you went fallout free, uh, you might be achieving less military effect, then obviously the real purpose here has to be something else. Um, and shock factor is, is certainly uh, going to be expected to be part of the calculus of, of the decision to make use. So we're at that time where we have to take a quick break. 
But when we come back, what, what I want, I would ask you to sort of give us some examples of how historically we might have relied on nuclear weapons to achieve an effect, but now there are cons- you know different conventional capabilities that can achieve that same effect. And and what exactly are those those trade offs? Like for example, when we talk about cleaver, uh, maybe if you can e- explain that example. So you're listening to Nuclecast, and we'll be right back. This episode of Nuclecast is brought to you by the AMLA Deterrence Center, whose mission is to educate Americans about the nuclear enterprise and strategic deterrence. And we're back and we're talking again to James McCune of the National Institute for Deterrent Studies. And we're talking about our article that compares and contrasts the capabilities of low-yield tactical nuclear weapons to conventional PGMs. So your modern cruise missiles, you know, there's a whole host of capabilities, actually. So I gave you a question before the break. Can you, can you delve into that topic for me? Yeah, yeah. So, so in the years past, right, the defend the fold of gap has, has been a, a consistent uh, use case uh, concern problem set that we need to address, and and you can look at it in, in two ways, right? You can see uh, tanks uh, needing to go anti armor uh, in a in a dispersed manner, uh, needing to create those air area effects. Um, now, in in our uh, assumptions, because of the nature of it being a limited strike. We're assuming that we're going to maintain fallout free. So the trying to intentionally use uh, the uh, fallout for uh, anti uh, or uh, counter uh, area is, is not a factor. So it's it's going to be that high uh, effect blast. But it was going to come with the potential of undesired escalation. So we've been looking for alternatives. And I think that's one of the ways we show uh, the U.S. Uh, consistent interest over time is we invested in other alternatives. So. Uh, the cluster bomb unit is the one we talk about there because it was explicit about uh, anti-armor and, and it gives us a nice uh, arc as uh, we're still trying to find something better than the CVU. Um, but the other uh, thing you might be uh, trying to uh, go against is uh, a, a just a, a large scale um, major theater war, right? Where, where your overall magazine depth becomes a problem. Uh, whether it's a high intensity conflict where you're losing aircraft or losing airfields. Uh, and either way, uh, you might be concerned about needing to get the greatest efficiency out of those aircraft or uh, maybe, you know, days past ground launch systems, uh, ground launch cruise missiles. Uh, the concern is to be able to get the best bang for your buck. And, you know, that's one of the enduring things about nuclear weapons that physics dictate um, that they will always be providing uh, the greatest amount of, of uh, explosive power per pound um, from, uh, you know, as compared to anything else. So when you get to that mass attack, one of the interesting things that we have now is, and it's coming out in the news, um, pretty regularly, Japan has said, Hey, we would like this capability is a rack that goes into the back of a cargo plane. And right now they're, they're focused on JASM. So that's the, uh, U S uh, cruise missile. Um, it's our uh, top of the line cruise missile. Cause it's uh, got low observability built into it. Um, and the idea is you, you just function a, a a standard uh, airdrop process for the cargo plane. And when the rack goes out the back, it's got parachutes. It, it orients the, the uh, cruise missile so that it can then launch and, and execute its mission. Um, we, we had some fun with numbers. Uh, we recognize that um, there are not actually, uh, you know, a, a call to turn all of our C-130s and C-17s into bombers. But the, the reality is, uh, you know, we have such a huge uh, airlift capacity in the U.S., for you know, obvious reasons within our our, our DoD, um, that you could actually uh, make a you know, much more uh, you know you, you could deliver far more cruise missiles than exist in the inventory in a single sortie. Um, so when we talk about uh, capacity, um, these uh, other options are quite interesting. Not just because uh, 
they're approaching those low yield uh, levels of effects. But it's also interesting because the opportunity to expand that capability, uh, you don't have to have stealth bombers if you have stealth cruise missiles and you can share that with your friends. Um, means to uh, improve assurance uh, outside of uh, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the myopic or the, 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 the kind of the focus on nuclear weapons because there are, you know, other opportunities. We talk about missile defense sometimes for the intent of assuring our allies. So uh, it gets at the tactical problem for mass attack while also uh, providing uh, new opportunities uh, for assurance and deterrence. Yeah. And, and this is sort of one of those trade-offs that we talk about in the article that I would encourage. And I don't think I gave uh, the actual name of the article. So if you'll go to the summer edition of Ether, I said it was in Ether, and the the name of it is a tactical nuclear mindset. It's the lead article in the in the issue. So a tactical nuclear mindset, and the big challenge or a big challenge that we talk about is this idea that. You can achieve some similar effects with all of these advanced conventional capabilities that we have, which are actually quite amazing. The U.S. has has done amazing things here. But one of the biggest problems is magazine depth. And, you know, like, like you said, we have the cargo capacity. But even if, let's suppose hypothetically, even if we were to alleviate Air Mobility Command from having to actually deliver anything but the munition we wanted it to. It had no other missions. We wouldn't even have the weapons to do it. And we're not going to buy enough weapons to load out all of the cargo aircraft. That's not in the books. And I think this is the one of the things that the war in Ukraine is exposing as we th- try to think about you know, potentially a conflict over Taiwan is that we have these exquisite capabilities, but we don't have them in large numbers. So therefore we may find ourselves in a circumstance where we've used our PGMs because we want to avoid a nuclear conflict, but we're at the point where the only thing left we have are these nuclear weapons. And that was sort of one of those big challenges we tried to address and, and deal with. Yeah. I mean, you, you can't play a, a one turn game and be surprised when it doesn't work out on turn three. Um, you, you've got to show credibility, uh, capability uh, to, to endure throughout uh, what is the you know expected uh, duration uh, and capacity for the fight. And so if you're going to commit to staying entirely conventional, uh, you've got to make sure you can prove it. And alternatively, um, you know, if, if you're going to come in nuclear, uh, you still have to think through it because we don't have an endless supply there either. Um, and one of the concerns that I see um, is your typical response, just logic um, of somebody, you know, hits you, you want to hit them back. Um, it, you want to show, and, and, and now you, you bring in the concerns about messaging, so cross-cultural messaging, multi-domain messaging, and, and all of these complications where folks write about often uh, the fear of, of uncontrolled uh, escalation or the almost expected and hoped for uh, can, uncontrolled escalation so that we don't have to think about uh, this niche scenario, this, this limited, uh, narrow scenario. Um, but what, what I often find is, is folks would think, well, they went low yield, they went against X sort of target say an airfield. Okay, well, we want to strike their airfields, say tit for tat approach. And when uh, sometimes I play the role for, for red teaming, I would intentionally design it so that led to catastrophic failure for them, for blue, on move three, um, for whatever reason. And you can set it up in different ways. So uh, you have to look through uh, both lenses uh, to look for uh, the potential that uh, the adversary wants to win, that the adversary is expecting and anticipating your, your initial response. And you should be skeptical about your own initial leanings uh, in that case, because whether you're talking about a, you know, running out of conventional munitions or low yield munitions, uh, low yield nuclear weapons, uh, those are both possibilities um, and need to be accounted for. Yeah. And then one of the other topics we talk about is 
just sort of an adversary view. And so take the Russians, for example, in an earlier article for Ether, um, Chris Yaw and Dave Rabine and John Swiegel write about Russia's fear of NATO, primarily American, fifth generation fighters with advanced conventional systems that can fly, you know, in into Russia and start attriting their capabilities and that they really don't have a good response for that. And so one of the things that they talk about is that this is sort of escalatory. It's this it's the conventional capability that is escalatory because it's what the Russians fear most because they think it's more usable. And this is sort of one of those things that many adversaries think about as they say, well, listen, it's conventional. So you don't have the same level of restraint as you do with a nuclear weapon. And so therefore, you know, we, the U S we're always like, ah, oh, it's conventional. So therefore, you know, it's, it's not going to be as perceived as being as escalatory, but for adversaries who don't have a good counter to it, they say, whoa, that's really usable. And therefore, they fear it and see it as escalatory. Whereas with nuclear weapons, they know you're going to be much more restrained in their use. And, and it, therefore, their fear level comes down. And so that that's just sort of one of those difficult issues that the United States really has to think through as it says, well, we'll, you know, we'll build more conventionals. When in reality, that's what they fear most. And I find it uh, interesting. I mean, they're looking at pop culture, educated uh, culture on, on nuclear. I right? just had Oppenheimer come out, have folks having these conversations. Uh, the fear can overtake and the discussion goes to this uh, place where they say, well, we don't like low yield weapons because they're too usable and those are scary. Um, but then they don't continue that conversation uh, into what you're talking about, into this idea that... Um, the, the unrespondable or the, the, the threat which the adversary doesn't have any response to can be quite concerning and you know may, may bring them down the, the road uh, to considering that their only option uh, for response. Dominance uh, comes up in our literature a lot. And I mean, I'm an aviator, so I, I much appreciate air dominance over anything else uh, if I have to operate. But at a strategic, even a theater strategic, not uh, existential concern, uh, it can be a problem if you're not cognizant of and aware of thinking through the effect when you want to get to that negotiation table, because let's be frank, it, ending a war, it includes negotiation. It doesn't, uh, you know, you, you can't always say the only plan is, is unconditional surrender. It doesn't work. It didn't work when we used the nuclear weapons last time because we actually ended up with some caveats to the unconditional surrender before they signed. Um, and so I think we, we, have folks that either, you know, dissociate in their mind uh, this idea that, well, we don't want low yield weapons to be usable, but these other things are, which are quite usable and can achieve nearly the same effect, not recognizing uh, the influence and impact that's going to have. So we're at that time in the show where I start to bring out my genie Bob and I'm going to rub my magic lamp and I'm going to let you make three wishes in regard to th this this dynamic issue we're talking about, what okay. would wish number one be? Well, uh, you know, I'm gonna you, you gave me some softball and gave me a couple, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and use up my first <laughs> one to make sure that uh, we get that message out to everyone, no matter what anyone's impression uh, might be, uh, having heard or read different things. Uh, I hope that we never see nuclear weapons used again, uh, employed again. Use is good. Employment is bad. Um, go with two. However, should that fail and they become a, a problem for us uh, used in anger, I hope that whatever that uh, country uh, or other actor uh, sought to achieve is unambiguously a failure and the whole world takes notice. Um and, and three, um, I hope uh, that the U.S. has all the things we need, uh, physical and policy-wise, uh, to achieve it. <laughs> yeah. 
It's like, I, I forget who, who it was that says that, you know, they support denuclearization except for us, you know, <laughs> I, which, uh, you know, you can't help but, but agree with that one. Now, as, as we sort of end the show, we've, we've had this conversation about these comparing and contrasting low yields and conventionals. And, you know, the listeners out there will, will have been sort of trying to think through in their minds and, and picture the discussion that we're having. And particularly for those that don't think about this topic, like, you know, we may have folks that have different backgrounds. They may be DOE lab scientists or they may be contractors, but they, they might not think about this topic. So if you want to leave them sort of a clear message to walk away with from our conversation that is sort of the, you know, the bottom line up front, but at the end, what would that message be? On the bottom line, on the bottom. Uh, I would say that uh, there is no silver bullet. And, And what I mean by that is they have to be careful to think through the first, second, third order effects of, of whatever thing they think is going to solve their problems. Often we look at that grass is greener from the other side perspective. Uh, I'm nuclear. Uh, it's not going to be a problem. The conventional side will just dominate and will win and vice versa, um, which we know from public writings is, is you know, quite been a problem for us in the recent years. Uh, the conventional side, nuclear happens and it's Stratcom's problem, not us. Um, no, it's both of these camps. It's both of our problem. Um, and more clear thinking is needed. And I would extend that to the camp that doesn't want any nuclear weapons either. We need to have some discussions. We need to think through this um, and, and put things on the table so we can get to the complete logical flow start to finish. Um, how we can imagine folks would not succeed in those objectives and then work backwards to creating the posture that discourages them from ever trying. Okay. James McHugh, thanks for joining us on Nuclecast. Thanks for having me. And thanks to you, the listeners, and we'll see you on the next episode. Well, uh, good chat with James McHugh. Uh, That topic is it's a really complicated topic because when you're trying to do that kind of almost an analysis of alternatives or that that the article is where you're weighing one versus the other. And it's a, it's a fairly technical article just for the nature of how you evaluate nuclear versus, you know, precision guided conventional. Uh, So hopefully Uh, It wasn't too detailed or too technical of a discussion. And so hopefully you still got something out of it. Um, If you, if you were confused or uncertain about sort of how we were talking about the, you know, the pros and cons of either one, make sure you go read the article. (laughs) So go do that. And uh, thanks for joining us. This has been a production of the Anwa Deterrence Center. Our executive producer is Kimberly Charrington, and this episode has been engineered and mixed by David Grunthal. Follow the show on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter at Nuclecast. Listen, follow, and review the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.